Hope you've all managed to find a seat inside. There are some more seats just at the front here. If you'd like a little bit more space, there's plenty of space to spread out. And if you're joining us online, you're very, very welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. If you're part of our regular congregation, if you're a visitor here to Pembrokeshire, it's just wonderful to have you here together to worship God together. So let's open our hearts. Let's just still our hearts before him as we come into his presence this morning. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, breathe on us afresh, we pray. We hear the sound of the rushing wind, and we remember how on the day of Pentecost, there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Holy Spirit, would you breathe like a rushing wind across everything that happens in this place, in our living rooms, wherever we're joining from this morning? May we know you flooding our hearts again with your love. May we draw closer to you. May we be set free to worship you properly. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you're here. Holy Spirit, come and move amongst us, we pray. God, we worship you. We open our hearts to respond to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Anne is going to come and lead us in worship this morning. Thanks, Anne. It's lovely to have you with us if you're watching online and in the building. Um, and we've come to worship the Lord this morning. And thinking of the storm over the weekend... It's safe to say we all got a bit blown away. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, I did anyway. Um, but Jesus um, dealt with many storms, um, physically, mentally, spiritually. And he knows just what it's like to be in a storm and through a storm and to carry us through a storm. So this morning we're going to worship the Lord and just thank him for carrying us through this storm, especially the one on the weekend. So let's stand as we worship him together.
Isaiah 1 verse 18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And this morning, as we come to the Saviour who paid it all, may we give our everything back to him. You know, he didn't just walk and talk and draw close to us. He gave his all for us, every last drop of blood he gave for us. And this morning, let's just pour out our heart in prayer and thanksgiving and just surrender to the Lord this morning and just say thank you, God, for what you've done. Not only did you come to, to, to your people to, to be and to dwell with them, but you also gave us life and life in all its fullness. You, you never stop, you, you always go above and beyond and we just thank you for that Lord and this morning may we just come wholeheartedly to God and say thank you for every last thing that you've done Amen i 
Jesus, that you paid it all for me, that you paid it all for us and for the world. We just thank you this morning that we can come to you and praise you like you deserve to be praised. We say thank you, God, from the bottom of our heart. We love you and we thank you. Thank you for every drop of blood that was shed on the cross and that you came to set us free and to redeem us and to give us life and life in all its fullness. And you didn't stop there. You said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. You know, you come where we can't go. You paid the price that we could never pay. And because of you, we stand here this morning amazed in your wonder and your splendor, Lord. We, we just praise you. We worship you. And Father God, I pray you'd speak to each and every one of us this morning by your spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats.
We're going to continue in worship together as we come to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to do things slightly differently this week. Don't all fall off your chairs at once. But we're going to, we're going to pray using a video. Uh, it's a video we use during our time of 24-7 prayer. And um, there's some music that goes underneath it. And throughout the video, you're going to see different pictures of different things in our society and in our world. I want you to think about the things that are shown on the screen and offer up the things and places that you can think of that are on your heart, a burden on your heart, as they provoke um, different ideas, different thoughts, different prayers in your heart. Just it quietly in your heart, just offer them to the Lord. And as we think of our own country and our own community, some of these images as well, let's think about um, Russia and the Ukraine, where so much is going on, people with their everyday lives under such a threat. We can offer those things to the Lord as well. And, and in the wake of Storm Eunice, and with another storm, whatever it's called, Franklin, is it next? Whatever the next storm is, just offering all these everyday things to the Lord as we lift our community before him. So no one is going to pray from the front, but together as God's people, we're going to, in our hearts, lift them to the Lord as we see all these images on the screen. Thanks, Viola. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart.
We're blessed to be a blessing, aren't we? And as you've seen those images, maybe you've been having thoughts or feelings and have been offering them to the Lord. Maybe it's to inspire your prayers in your own time during this week. There's so much that goes on in society. And Jesus wants to be a part of that. His kingdom wants to be made known in and through all these different things that are happening. So let's pray that prayer that asks God's kingdom to come and his will to be done right here on earth in the middle of all this ordinary stuff as it is in heaven. So let's unite together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. We're going to have our Bible reading. We're going through the book of Mark. As you know at the moment, if you've not had one of these and on your marks, it's just got some simple questions and ideas of how you can study the passage that we're going through each week. They're at the back, or they might be at the front later. Uh, Just pick one of those up. And I'd encourage you, if you've not yet started, it's the ideal opportunity to read the passage again after we've heard it on a Sunday morning and to just delve into it during the week. We can't hope to cover it all on a Sunday morning, but there's so much that God wants to say to us through this wonderful uh, gospel that we've been given. So pick that up and have a go, maybe with your kids, maybe with your spouse, with a friend, whoever it might be. That will be fantastic. Han and Reuben are going to come up. They're going to read the first bit of our passage, and then Steph is going to come up straight away afterwards, and she's going to do the next bit, because we're looking at a big swathe of scripture this morning, so that would be wonderful. Thanks, Reuben. Continuing in Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side, leaving the cloud behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped, swamped, swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? If we drown, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still... Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came up from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of a large area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon, um, to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus had crossed the lake. And people crowded all around him. Men, women, children, they were all there. They wanted to see and hear Jesus. Suddenly, a man came. It was Jairus, one of the synagogue rulers, and he knelt to Jesus' feet and he pleaded with him. My little girl is dying, he said. Please will you come and lay your hands on her and then she will be healed and be well. So Jesus went with Jairus. As the crowd went along, a woman But instead of getting better, she only got worse. She thought, if I can just touch Jesus' clothes, I would be well. She didn't want to make a fuss. She pressed through the crowd, and she reached out, and she touched his cloak. Immediately, the bleeding Immediately, she knew that she was healed, that she was well. Jesus said, who touched my clothes? The disciples that were with him said, look at all the crowd around you. And you're asking, who touched me? But Jesus knew that power had gone out of him. And so he continued to look around The woman came and knelt at Jesus' feet and she told him the, all the truth about what had been happening to her over the years and how she thought if she just touched him, she'd be well and how he'd, she'd been healed. And Jesus looked at her and said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Don't suffer anymore. You're healed. Just then, a messenger came. The messenger worked at Jairus' house, and he came to say, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter has died. But Jesus heard what he said, and he said, don't be afraid, just believe. Taking just Peter, James, and John, Jesus went with Jairus towards his house. When he got there, there was a great commotion. People were crying and wailing. Why are you making such fuss, said Jesus? The girl is only sleeping. They laughed at him because they knew that the little one had died.
Jesus went into Jairus' house, taking Peter, James, and John with him. There was Jairus' mother, Jairus and his wife, the little girl's mother. And Jesus went over to the little girl and took her by the hand and said, little girl, get up. And immediately, the girl who was about 12 years old, stood up, back to life, fully well. Don't tell anyone, said Jesus, and give her something to eat. How amazing is the God we love and serve. How mighty is his power, and he's as great today as he was then. Thanks, Steph. Fantastic. If you want to have that passage open in your Bibles or on your devices, wherever it might be, we're going to jump into looking about um, the, the big picture. We're not going to go into every detail, but the big picture of what is Mark trying to tell us as we read these things. But um, I've got a picture to show you, first of all, an illusion. Here we go. What do you see when you look at this picture? Kids, if any of you can decide, if you're in the crash, if you're watching online or in the overflow, or if you're in the building, what do you see when you look at the picture? Just shout out, anyone. A duck and a rabbit. A duck and a what? A and a rabbit. Okay. If you see mainly the duck, if that's the first thing you see, I want you to put your hand up. Okay. That's a big majority. Okay. If you see, that's not a duck, that's a bunny. If that's the first thing you see, put your hand up. Okay, I wonder what that says about you. Brilliant. (laughs) Wonderful. Okay, but both are true, aren't they? This is a really famous illustration from about 100 years old because there's both a duck and a bunny rabbit in the picture. And, And apparently it depends where your focus is or what you look for or what you're looking for as to what you see. Both things are true. It's definitely a duck, but it's also definitely a bunny rabbit. And when we look at Mark's gospel, actually we're seeing something where there are two realities that are both true going on at the same time. If we can have the next slide, please. We see how, first of all, Mark is writing history. I know I keep saying this, but I want us to get this deep down in who we are, that Mark is not making this up. He's not dreaming it up on a summer's day. He's not writing a fictitious account. He's not taking stuff away or adding stuff in. He's writing history based on the eyewitness testimony of Peter. So what I want you to do in your Bibles, in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, open your Bible up with the person next to you, whether they're a kid, whether they're a grown-up, whoever it might be, have a look and what are the eyewitness things that jump out at you? Just have a look, just for a minute, and we're going to shout out some ideas. What are the things that you think, hang on a second, that must be because they saw it happen. That's a weird thing to put in if you were making this story up. Just have a little look in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, and see if you can think. We'll just spend a minute doing it. If you're joining us online, you can do the same back home. Open your Bible up. What are the things that you, you think, okay, this is a definitely an eyewitness moment. This is something they saw happen in real life. Anyone want to go first? Any feature that kind of jumps out at you? Who could it be? Go on, put your hand up if you've seen anything. Go on, Reuben. Jesus sleeping in the stern. And actually, I love the fact it says on a cushion. It's really specific, isn't it? That's something that someone's seen and gone, hang on a sec, that's weird. Jesus was asleep on a cushion. Thank you. Any other moments like that that remind us this is history? This is an eyewitness testimony. There were other boats. It's just such a throwaway phrase in verse 36. There were also other boats with him. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know if they sank. We don't know what they did. But there were other boats. Why? Because someone saw it happen. Anyone else? Any other ideas? Yes, Sibylla. Fantastic, yeah. 
If you were making a story up about the people in the early church, Peter and all the disciples, you wouldn't make them look like Muppets, would you? You wouldn't do it. And yet that time and time again, they cry out, as Sibylla said, don't you care if we drown? Like, what's going on? What are you doing? Again, an eyewitness feature. They're not, Mark's not making it up. He's not sugarcoating it. He's telling it like it is. And the disciples look like bumbling fools who just don't get it so often in Mark's gospel. Anything else? Any other features? Just one other feature that I noticed is just the, the description of it. The way in which it says, um, a furious squall came up. We could have said that about Storm Eunice, couldn't we? Our fence was flapping like crazy. A furious squall flapped my fence, I could put. But it's an eyewitness account, isn't it? So that uh, the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So I'd encourage you this week, when you're reading Mark or any part of the Bible where this is narrative, yes, Jacob, Do you still have no faith? Yeah, Jesus is really honest with them, isn't he? Jesus is really brutally honest with them, and Mark records that. I'd encourage you this week, open your Bible. When you're reading it, look for the eyewitness moments, those moments that remind us, this isn't made up. This isn't fictitious. This is reality, because Mark is writing history. So we've seen the duck, but look from another perspective. There's also the bunny. Because Mark is writing what many believe is an apocalypse. It doesn't mean end times. It's talking about unveiling. That's what the word means. Remember, back in week one, we thought how apocalypse means going behind the scenes to see the reality about what you're actually facing. And so if that's true, if we're looking from a different perspective at the bunny, we're realizing Mark is selecting and arranging these historical moments in his gospel so that we, and particularly his early readers, knew something about who Jesus was. He's trying to teach them theology. He's trying to teach them reality of what is going on underneath the surface. It might look like things are one way, But what's really going on when you look a bit more closely? So if you go to the next slide, please, Viola. So just to remind you who Mark's writing to, he's most likely writing to the church in Rome in AD 64, and they're facing massive challenges. Here's a picture of some of the challenges they're facing. Their lives are chaos. Middle of AD 64, great fire of Rome. It burns for nine whole days. It claims thousands of victims And as a result, millions are left homeless. Now, that's a chaos that Storm Eunice hasn't quite touched, doesn't it? You know, maybe coronavirus comes close. Our our whole way of life turned upside down in a moment. If we have the next picture, another one. Yeah, here we are, people having to flee. This would have affected the Christians in Rome. They didn't escape this. So Mark is writing, if we can have the next picture, he's writing to a people who are living with chaos. Their favorite walks have been destroyed. Their houses and their belongings have been destroyed. Everything they cherish and love is gone. Their lives have been turned upside down overnight. So he's writing to a people facing chaos, but he's also writing to a people facing this, to a people facing evil authorities. This guy is on the throne. I saw a 3D reconstruction of what he might really have looked like. It was not a pretty sight. It was very strange. This is Caesar Nero. He's a brutal dictator. He used the fire. In fact, many people were saying he started the fire. He used the fire to his own ends to build his own palaces and to feather his own nests. You know what he was doing while Rome burned? He was at a party. Don't know about you, that sounds kind of familiar. (laughs) While Rome burned, he was at a party. And what he does is he blames the fire on the Christians. The fingers were all pointing at him. He goes, no, it wasn't me. It was this despicable group of people over here. This is what a historian called Tacitus says 40 years afterwards. He says, consequently, to get rid of the report that he'd done it, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Again, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Their crime that they're convicted of is not just these are evil people doing bad things. No, the ruling authorities are starting to say, these Christians, they hate humans. 
they hate humanity itself. Again, we kind of resonate with that, don't we, in our day? When fingers are being pointed and people are beginning to say, if you believe the Bible, if you live in a certain way, actually, you're not just a bad person, you hate people. So there's the ruling authorities they're having to deal with, and then there's this, death. They're facing, if we can have the next slide, please, but they're facing death every single day, social and physical death. This is Tacitus again. He says this, mockery of every sort was added to the Christians' deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Christians are being rounded up. They are facing chaos, evil authorities, and then ultimately death because they believed in Jesus. This is the time when church history says Peter met his end. This is also a few years later, the time when Paul met his end. Death is not um, something that is fictitious for the Christians. It's not something a long way in the future. They are living with the reality of this every single day. And so to a people whose lives are ruled by chaos, evil authorities, and death, Mark writes these three stories, and he writes it to teach them and to remind them this might look like it's reality. It might look like it might look like chaos and the world, the authorities, and death have won. But who's really got the power? What's really going on? Look one way, you see the duck. Look at all, another way, and actually behind the scenes, there's the bunny. Jesus has got the power. He's got the power over the chaos. He's got the power over the authorities. He's got the power over death itself. And I believe the Holy Spirit, as God spoke to the early church through what Mark said, he wants to speak to us as we live in a world of chaos as we live in a world faced by evil authorities, if we live in a world dominated by suffering and death, he wants us to remind, be reminded who's really got the power. It looks like these things are on the throne, but actually Jesus has authority over the chaos, over the authorities, and over death itself. And so, first story, Jesus calms the storm. He's got power over the chaos. In the ancient world, water was a symbol of chaos. Water was a symbol of chaos. So, uh, and time and time again in the Bible, we see how God has authority over the waters. So Genesis 1, if you know your Bibles, you go right back to the beginning of creation. What does God do? He puts uh, limits on the waters. He separates the dry land from the water. He brings order into the chaos. The Spirit of God hovers over the waters at creation. God brings order into chaos. Then in the Exodus, again, God's people in chaos, they're in slavery. What happens? We thought about it a few weeks ago. The waters are divided. God has authority over the waters. They go through the water into the promised land. What does the water do? It crashes back on their enemies. God's authority over the chaos. It's the same in Joshua. They're in the chaos of wilderness wanderings. They get to the Jordan River that's in flood, a barrier stopping them from getting into the promised land. The Jordan River divides. God does it. God's people go through into the order of life in the promised land. God has authority over the chaos. Then in Psalm 107 verse 29, there's quite a few Psalms speak of this, but just this one says this. He, that means God, he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Again, God having control over the waters, control over the chaos. If we go to the next slide, please. Some of you will know this story from Sunday school. I was talking to Simeon, my little boy, the other day. He said, Jonah's my favorite Bible story. And I said, listen out for this bit, Sim. He's listening in the overflow. So, Sim, this bit's for you, okay? Jonah. Jonah. In the book of Jonah, we read this. Next slide, please. So we see how Jonah is on a mission to the Gentiles. He's not doing very well. It. He's running in the opposite direction. Um, in the middle of all this, a violent storm erupts. Jonah's flat out in the boat. The sailors cry out to God for help. God calms the sea. And the response of the sailors is fear of God. And as Mark writes this account, he's picking up on all these echoes from the Old Testament 
about God being in control of the waters because what do we see? Here we see Jesus in Mark 5 on a mission to the Gentiles. He's going over to Gentile territory, the Decapolis. There's a violent storm erupts. Jesus is flat out in a boat. The disciples cry out in anguish. Jesus calms the storm and the response of the disciples is one of awe and fear. So this is absolutely something that really happened in a moment of history. Jesus calming the storm. But Mark's also saying, what's really going on? And the question of the disciples is a question Mark wants us and his first readers to ask. Who is this man? Then even the wind and the waves do what he says. If the waves and the wind obey him, well, who is he? He's, he's God, isn't he? He's the God who brings order into chaos. Look one way, and this is just an ordinary bloke asleep on a pillow after a long day's work. But look another way, and this is God himself, the God of creation, bringing order into the chaos. It's what God always does. In the chaos, we all have a tendency to ask those same questions, don't we? I know I do. When things kind of threaten me or kind of come like waves in my life, I tend to ask these two questions. Um, God, why are you sleeping? That's the first one. Like, what are you doing right now? And the second one is this. Don't you care if I, if we drown? They're the questions the disciples have. Questions the church in Rome must have been asking God. Like, this is so awful right now. Wave after wave of trouble and disaster and death itself staring us in our friends. Our friends have been, have been taken and have been tortured and have been killed. Why are you asleep? Don't you care if we drown? Maybe, maybe this morning you resonate with those questions because for you it feels like wave after wave after wave of trouble and chaos and suffering and struggle. Maybe it's wave after wave of, 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 of depression or anxiety that swamps the boat that you're in and you can't pull yourself out of it. Maybe it's wave after wave of financial pressure and debt that's mounting up and you feel like you're crippled by it. It's just swamping the boat that you're in. Maybe it's loneliness or, or relationship difficulties or worry for your kids or your family or your friends and it's like, Wave after wave of disappointment, deluge after deluge of disaster, swamping the boat that you're in. And whether you're asking this question now or you're going to ask it in the future, God, why are you sleeping? Why have you not done something about the chaos I'm in? Why are you not doing something? And don't you care if I drown? I read a book to my kids called The Storm That Stopped that's about this story, and I love what it says in response to the disciples' question. They say, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? And the book says, what a silly thing to say to Jesus. Of course he cared. He loved his friends so much that one day he was going to die for them. Maybe that's a word for us this morning. Not that we don't, re uh, that we don't need to be real with God. He's big enough to take these questions he wants to hear the plea of our heart, but, but, but on the other hand, what a silly thing to say to Jesus. Of course he cares. He loved you so much he was prepared to die for you. He loved you so much that he gave his all so that you could know his peace, so that he could know you, uh, so that you could know him living in your life. Because where is Jesus in the middle of the disciples' storm? In the middle of the church in Rome's storm, in the middle of our storm, he's in the boat. The point is not he calms the storm. That's amazing. Proves he's God. But the point is they don't need to fear, Jesus says, because he's right there in the boat with them. And Maybe some of us need to be reminded of that this morning. It is awful what you're going through. There is wave after wave. You feel like you're trying to bail it out and there's more water coming in than you can bail. And, and Jesus would say, there's no need to fear when I'm in the boat. I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm the God who brings order into the chaos of your lives. There's no need to fear when he's in the boat. So he's got authority over the chaos. 
And then Mark moves on and he shows us how Jesus has authority over the authorities. And we've seen this, haven't we, in Mark already? You know, Jesus casting out demons, big deal. It happens all the time in Mark. But what's different here? Again, just open Mark 5 with the kids sitting next to you or with the adults sitting next to you. Um, just have a look between verse 1 and verse 10 as Mark's readers, surrounded by Romans, okay? As they're surrounded by as they read this, as they hear it being read to them, what's the word that just goes, oh, in their hearts? What's the word that jumps out at them as they read this passage? Anyone got any ideas? Give you a clue. It's in verse 9. Anyone? What did you say, Lid? Legion. Legion. Well done. From one direction, legion just means many, doesn't it? It just means thousands. It just means a lot. It's just the name of the demon on that particular day in history. But from another direction, what's it saying when Mark's readers hear that? They're surrounded by Roman legions. You know, they know that the legion is the Roman way of controlling people. It's the way Rome uses to exercise its authority, to assert its dominance, to put down rebels. There were 6,000 soldiers in a legion. I don't know how many legions there were, but there were a lot of them. So it was the, the military system by which Rome asserted that it was the boss. It was in control. Caesar was Lord. Caesar was God. That was the system they used. So as they're reading this, yes, on the one hand, something's happening historically that Mark is recording, but from another, he's presenting it to us in such a way there's another layer going on. Jesus has authority over the authorities, even the authorities of Rome. And so we see in this passage, if we just go back to the last screen for a second, we see how we see a man tormented by legions of demons who's ruled by an evil that wants to destroy him and he's set free and he's made whole and he's restored and the legions of demons plunge to their own destruction. That's what happens in that historic moment. And then there's this other layer going on because the people of God in Rome are surrounded by the legions of Rome. They're ruled by an evil tyrant who wants to destroy them. And Mark's reminding them, this has happened to you. You have been set free. You have been made whole. You have been restored. And one day, the evil legions of Rome ultimately will plunge to their destruction. Every evil authority will bow to the king of kings. But right now, you've been set free because Jesus has authority over the authorities. He's reminding them, yeah, from one angle, it looks like evil's winning. But look another way. Jesus is still Lord. Jesus is still the Son of God. Jesus still has power over the authorities. He's not pacing up down, up and down in heaven going, oh my goodness, what am I doing? What a mess. What a challenge. No, Jesus is on the throne. He is Lord. He's working his purposes out. He's omni-resourceful, working his purposes out through other things that are happening in the world. The evil of people, Jesus is able to work through even man's evil to bring about good for those who live him. And for us this morning, sometimes in our lives, in our world, it looks like evil's winning, doesn't it? There are people, as we thought earlier, who would say, you know, if you love Jesus, you're a hater of humanity. You're a hater of humanity. You don't love what's good. You don't love what's right. And ideologies and authorities that would set themselves up against Jesus, and it looks like they're winning. And this is just a reminder this morning that Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is still Lord. He's not given up. He's not diminished in power. He has power over the authorities. And we, as his people, have been set free. We've been made whole and we've been restored. And the challenge for us is the challenge for that demon-possessed man. Because what did he do? He wanted to leave. Jesus, okay? Jesus is being kicked out by those people. You think, amazing miracle, they want him there? No, they don't. They want Jesus to leave. And the demon-possessed man who's been set free says, actually, I want to leave too. I'm not staying here. I want to follow you where you're going, Jesus, back to the safe place where you are. 
And Jesus says, no, no, no. This is what he says in verse 19. Go home to your own people and tell how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. What a challenge for that man to do that. What a challenge for the church in Rome to go home to those who were saying, you hate humanity, those who wanted to kill them, those who thought they were weirdos, and say, this is what Jesus has done for me. What a, what a challenge for you and me in our day. Not to form holy little huddles where we escape from the world and feel all cozy and Christian and it's wonderful, but actually to go out, to go home, to the people that, you know, the rest of this man's people didn't know about Jesus. That's the world we're living in, isn't it? That's the challenge for us, to go home to our own people, even those who might shun us, lie about us, hate us, be cynical about us, and say, look, I know that's what you think, but this is what Jesus has done for me. This is how he's changed me. This is how he's given me life. We have a hope to offer that no one else has. Everyone in our world's asking questions, and they think they've found the answers. And we've got the actual answer to all those questions. How can we keep that to ourselves? We're called to go home to our own people. I wonder, who is that for you? Who are this, those own people in your life? People who shun you, people who maybe have kind of withdrawn from you because you're a Christian. Maybe people even in your own family, and it's been hard to talk to them about Jesus. And they're, they're always cynical, and their hearts are always hard. Uh, and what would it look like for you to tell them? I don't mean sit them down and say, you're going to listen while I tell the gospel. But I mean to tell them with your lips, yeah, but also with your life. What would it look like for you this week to do that, to go home to your own people, remembering that though they hate you, though they despise you, Jesus is in, the, in, in control. He has authority over the authorities. And then finally, we see how Jesus has authority over death. What an encouragement for the Roman Christians and for us. So we see there's a young girl in one of the stories. She's 12 years old. She's part of the in crowd. Jairus' daughter, synagogue leader, very accepted. She's dying. Jesus delays. Something happens. He gets interrupted. He delays. And Jairus asks Jesus, would you touch her and make her well? Then there's this older woman. She's been sick for 12 whole years. She's an outcast. So her condition means she's unclean. She cannot go near other people. She's not meant to touch or be touched by anyone else. She is a social outcast. She's living a living death. It seems like God has delayed her healing by 12 whole years. That's what it looks like to that woman. And she touches Jesus. And both these women are wonderfully healed. Both are restored. Both of them are given a new lease of life. Both of them, in a sense, are returned from death. Jesus demonstrates as he, as he speaks to the, the woman, as, he, um, as she touches him, as he touches the little girl and raises her to her feet, he demonstrates that he has got authority, not just over sickness, but over death itself. Verse 26 says that the old woman had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, She'd spent all she had, and still she grew worse. Look one way. This is a wonderful miracle that happens at a particular moment in history. Jesus really does transform that little girl, that woman's life. Look another way. What's going on? It's a signpost that points us to a greater reality, that Jesus has got authority over sickness and death. And maybe for some of us this morning, like that woman, we have tried everything to get better. We've spent money, we've gone to places, maybe we've tried to get better physically or emotionally or mentally. We've tried everything and it's not worked. Maybe it's just been a stress in our lives or a challenge that we've been facing. We've done everything to try and get free of the suffering. It's worn us out and it feels like God has delayed and yet this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to remind us that God is still in control. Jesus still has authority. And you know, this glorious future that this moment points to is the fact that every single person who believes in Jesus gets healed. Maybe not in this life. And that's a question we have to wrestle with. Why not me? Why them? But 
But every single one of us gets healed ultimately. Every single one of us who's put our trust in Jesus rises from the dead ultimately. Why? Because through Jesus' death and resurrection, he defeated death. He took the sting out of it. He ripped it to pieces. He stamped on it by his glorious victory on the cross. And so now if we believe in Jesus, Jesus says, you will live even though you die. You will live even though you die. And when we get that, That changes, doesn't it, the way we view our sufferings in the here and now. Oh, that God would give us a bigger picture of what we're called to in the future. What awaits us, that there will be this moment where there's no sickness, no suffering, no death. What a hope for the Christians in Rome as their friends and loved ones are being persecuted as they themselves are dying. That death isn't the end. Death doesn't have the final victory. Suffering doesn't win in the end. Jesus has authority over death. There's a better future. They're going to see them again. All things will be restored and made well, and they will be with Jesus forever. I wonder, do you have this hope this morning? Maybe for some of us, we've never responded to Jesus. We've looked for answers in lots of different places, and Jesus is just inviting us this morning, come to me. You've tried to fix the chaos. You've tried to you know, go along with the authorities to make yourself acceptable. You've, you, you've tried everything to get better and it's not worked. But, but come to me because I've got authority over the chaos, over the authorities, and over death. Maybe for some of us it's just that reminder of who Jesus is. Job says, doesn't he, in the middle of his suffering, I know in whom I have believed. Maybe this morning we need to be reminded of whom we have believed. Who's really got the power this morning? It's Jesus, isn't it? The Lord of lords, the God of all glory, the one who made us, who loves us, who rescues us from our slavery to sin, who rose again, who's ascended, who is ruling right now. He is over the chaos of your life. He is over the authorities, whatever they say. He is over death itself. He's got the victory over it. What a savior we have in Jesus. Let's worship him as we close. And we're going to respond to all that we've heard. And we're going to sing again, um, Christ Alone Cornerstone. I'd invite you to stand. And as we do so, um, if Anne could come up as well, and Jane, please. As we do so, we're going to just respond to this and just worship the one who is Lord over the storm. Let's give him our concerns and our worries. And let's praise him for who he is. Let's worship the Lord together. Deb as well, if you're there, that'd be great. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are with us. And thank you that by your spirit, you want to empower us. You want to remind us of what we have believed this morning. Help us to trust you in the middle of our storms. We give them to you now. We worship you. You are Lord. Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every heart.
we worship you, Jesus. You alone are Lord. Thank you that you have authority over the chaos, over ideologies and authorities, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, and over death itself. This week, Lord, as we go into a world full of challenge, would you remind us of the hope that we have in you? Thank you that you're the God who's able to keep us from stumbling and that you want to present us before your glorious presence without fault and with great joy. We worship you. We praise you. And we give glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been great to have you with us. I'm not sure what the weather's looking like. It's a bit dicey, so we're going to do it inside. We're going to open the doors. If you're not comfortable staying and mingling inside, that's absolutely fine. Most said it's okay to be outside. We're going outside. We're going to go outside and brave the elements. Thanks, Case. So please join us for coffee. It'd be great to have um, all the bugs blown away. And uh, thank you for joining us online. Great to have you with us. We hope to see you very, very soon. God bless. up on the screen. I've just put some dates up on the screen. Over the next few Saturdays, there's going to be different things happening. We've got um, some music group training that begins next week. So if you um, would like to join us for that, you've got a gifting or you believe that God's calling you to be involved in the music group, please join us. There's going to be six events on Saturdays throughout the year. We're going to be looking at what it looks like to lead worship and preparing our hearts for that. So speak to Steph or myself if you'd like to join us. That's for anyone in the church who believes they're called to do that. Pick and Pray has been rescheduled to next week after we were about to get blown away last week. That's 11.30 on the 26th. We've got a prayer breakfast and work party on the 5th of March. That's at half seven. And just a reminder that safeguarding training is happening on the 2nd of April. If you're involved in the kids or youth ministry or think you might be in the future, we'd like you to come to that. We haven't taken an offering during the service this morning, but there will be a um, container to put your offering in. If you've not um, given online and you would like to give, there's no pressure, but that will just be there on your way out. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless.